Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 13, and can be found on page 153 of the New Testament of your Pew Bible. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word. Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, Hope and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. How many of you have heard this passage read at a wedding? That's what I thought. In fact, I would hazard a guess that many of us have heard this text used far more frequently at weddings than in any other service of worship. It has become one of the go-to passages for such celebrations, and for good reason, it is a beautiful testimony to the gift of love. Because we so often hear this passage from 1 Corinthians read against the backdrop of Pachelbel's canon and exquisite floral arrangements and a couple gazing lovingly into each other's eyes, this is the kind of love we imagine when we hear Paul's familiar words, and the greatest of these is love. We picture romantic love, the kind of love that makes us weak in the knees and causes those dormant butterflies to stir in our stomachs. And don't get me wrong, this is love that is worth celebrating and affirming and supporting. But it's not really the kind of love that Paul is talking about. Paul is writing this letter to a community that is deeply divided. The church in Corinth, we learn a mere ten verses into the letter, is plagued by conflict. Factions have emerged as members pledge allegiance to different teachers rather than affirming their unity in Christ. The wealthy disregard the poor, eating extravagant meals while others go hungry. Quarreling and infighting have become the norm. So Paul writes of love. 
because this is the only thing that will bind together this fractured community. He pauses after his treatise on spiritual gifts and how they work together for the health of the body to wax poetic on love. For he knows that without this virtue, the work of this community will prove futile. Paul writes this ode to love not because the Corinthian church excels in this department, far from it, but as a call to action. Love is patient. Love is kind. Paul describes an active love, a radical love, the kind of love that enables people of faith to commit to the messy and difficult work of being the church in a fractious world. As one scholar puts it, this kind of love is an up at dawn, feet on the ground, tools in hand, working kind of love. It's the kind of love that rejoices in diversity and heals division, that compels us to pursue justice and to serve one another, that gives generously and forgives freely, that binds us together in Christian unity and anchors us in the well-being of others. I dare say it's the kind of love that prompts many of us to commit our time our talent and our treasure to this church and to the work of Jesus Christ through this congregation. Good morning. My name is Rich Diver, and I am a balcony person. <laughs> Actually, I'm a Westminster lifer, baptized, confirmed, married, and eulogized my father here earlier this year, even though none of those events occurred in the loft that I consider to be one of my happiest places. As I look up from the pulpit this morning, I can still envision my grandfather, Richard Lowe, sitting in the back row, smiling and nodding as Jim Bennett was concluding a sermon. Why do we always sit in the balcony, Granddad? I remember asking him. Richie, my boy, we sit up here because some of us need to be closer to God, both literally and figuratively. Those are words that I've used myself on many occasions when asked why I, too, find my way up the stairs every Sunday that I am able to worship here. Westminster is my spiritual home and this congregation my family. Like many of my peers who grew up in Wilmington in this church, my sports activities and boarding school and college took me away from regular attendance and worship. And then with my own children and their interests, secular Sunday mornings kept us physically away from where we needed to be. For the most part now, I'm an empty nester and unable to renew my commitment to the WPC community. There are many people here that have provided me with so much personal support over 56 years. Among them, my favorite Sunday school teachers, Bob Curran, Jean May, and Jane Klein. Interim Pastor Jim Glass, a man whom I had never met, visiting me in the hospital, providing kind words and prayers as I recovered from a bout of pneumonia. And Ann Ledbetter, listening compassionately, calming my anxiety over the phone, hands-free of course, as I drove home from visiting one of my sons in Massachusetts distraught over the impending breakup of my marriage. 
In times of personal triumphs and sufferings, my church has been there for me. There are two balcony services that I and all of our church family present those days can never forget. First, John Walton's incredible resolve to heal a wounded congregation after the deaths of Fred and Cleta Matthias at the height of the Advent season, even as he obviously struggled to understand how such a heinous act could befall such wonderful giving people. Secondly, Greg Jones' leadership in the aftermath of the tragic kayaking accident that took the lives of Chad Miller and his brother and left us once again asking ourselves why. In both cases, we're reminded that God comforts us in our sorrow and gives us the strength to survive our most difficult of circumstances. The tears we shed, the hugs we share, the smiles we greet each other with, the hope that is renewed when, he, when we are here worshiping together. Those are just some of the things that make Miss Westminster home to me. I'm proud to be a church elder and to serve as chair of the stewardship campaign this year. As Dr. Jones correctly reminded me is that when I expressed the concern that I was way too busy to serve in such an important role this year, Rich, there is never a good time. <laughs> Giving back my time, the humble talents that I possess, and most importantly, the gifts that God has bestowed upon me are blessings that I appreciate more with every passing day. Amen. Good morning. My husband, husband Bob has a friend who refers to people who attend worship as church people. You know the ones who smile at the fellow member who cuts them off in the parking lot and later in the day has a fit of rage when a stranger does the same. Church people, they have it all figured out but they can't mend their lives church people, the ones who support the church financially with what they want to give rather than what they can give. I confess that I fall into a few of these slots and as such do not consider myself to be a good Christian. I know how to be a good Christian. I pray I could be a good Christian. But each week I fall short. Then Sunday comes around. I enter this building, and I experience the grace of God everywhere I turn. I am welcomed by fellow members who extend a kind hand and greeting to me, even though they may have had the same week I did. I see the smiling face of Susan Mosley, who has honored me with the privilege of teaching our children. Then there's the opening service with Greg and his warm, often humorous, and always sincere monologue conveying the humble message that although he has experienced a higher calling, he is still one of us. Then there's Paul. An extraordinary musician who masterfully leads our dedicated and highly talented choir. All of this comforts me as I sit in the pew. I am home and experiencing the calm that accompanies my weekly reboot. Then our pastors take scripture passages that are thousands of years old 
and apply them to my life on that very day. This causes me to reflect on the ways in which I am not following Jesus. Often Greg's sermons so closely entwine the Bible verses to my current life that I find myself thinking, is he talking to me? <laughs> At Westminster, learning about myself and the world and being inspired by others is not limited to the one hour in the sanctuary. I participate in opportunities at the 1010 hour that I find both enlightening and thought-provoking. There are limitless opportunities for volunteerism where I always receive more than I give. Having served on many committees during my time as a deacon and an elder, I was and continue to be inspired by the ever-present sincerity and grace of both the clergy and the administrative staff. And I'm equally inspired by the countless volunteers who contribute to the operations and outreach missions of this church, most of whom are sitting here this morning. The sum total of my relationships and experiences at Westminster provide me with the tools I need to develop a meaningful relationship with God one in which I accept and reflect his grace. I am proud to say that I am a member of Westminster Presbyterian Church, a community of faith that welcomes all people, even church people like me. Good morning. My name is Rick Suarez. If I've not had the pleasure of meeting you, it's funny that I'm moved to tears and I haven't even started. <laughs> but I think that um, the reason for tears is because the first message I wanted to share with you this morning is to say thank you. The honor that myself, Josh, our son, Alejandro, have in worshiping here is extraordinary. So really my prepared speech is supposed to say, we thank you, but my heart got the better of me. You have all been, in my opinion, beacons of what God wants us to be. Through your actions, through the kindness in your eyes, through the gifts, be it for Alejandro or the warm hug, I've seen God in so many of you. And for that, we should be very proud as a church. We all come to the church with our own spiritual journey or spiritual path. And mine was always plagued with me asking a lot of questions. I consider myself inquisitive. My husband considers me exhausting. <laughs> <clears throat> he stays around. But at the end of the day, having grown up in the Catholic Church, I was a teacher. I taught catechism asked a lot of questions, really not, not something that was really pushed at or looked at as a positive. So when I was 15, I asked to meet with the pastor there who really couldn't answer some questions for me. And in my opinion, it was then time for me to go seek answers other places. 
So I moved to the extreme. I went to the Church of Christ, a very literal, fundamentalist church, and I found a lot of learnings there as well. And that is literally learning from the Bible, interpreting accordingly, and at least it was clearer to me when my questions were answered. But really what I started to find, and it has little to do with the Church of Christ, and more to do with, I saw a lot of asterisks in religion, meaning a lot of exclusion, a lot of fine print on who should not have a role in the church, or why they shouldn't, or who is in and who is out. And all of a sudden, I started to find myself in college with six Church of Christ preacher roommates. We should drink on that one. <laughs> who would debate me in my own home, and we were roommates, but it was one of the most learning aspects of my life because it got me very close to the Bible and really challenging them on, you preach and talk love, but exclusion? What is so beautiful about this church is I don't see exclusion. Women are not excluded. Muslims are not excluded. Gay, lesbian, whatever your belief, you're not excluded. Is that not something to be extraordinarily proud of? Is that not something to tell everyone that you have found a place where God is his fullest or her fullest or the fullest? however you want to communicate that, it is a privilege to be in front of you. It is a privilege to worship God with you. I have a list of people who've made such a difference in our lives in such a small period of time. But I think, again, I'm not going to exclude the rest of you who we just haven't gotten to know. So here's my call to action to each one of you, being the lay sermon guy for today which is keep doing what you're doing. The hand that reaches out, the smile in the morning, the twinkle in your eye, that's God. That is God. Thank you. It is clear that Westminster holds a special place in our hearts. It is our love for Christ and for this church that draws us in on a Sunday morning when we could be hitting the golf course or waiting for a table at brunch or catching up on much needed sleep. It is our love for Christ and for this community that inspires us to commit our time, our talent, and our treasure to Westminster Presbyterian Church. Like Rich and Patty and Rick, you each have a story to tell about what Westminster means to you. I imagine you have stories about the comfort you have received in times of distress, about worship that has inspired you, about encounters that have drawn you into the radical love of Jesus Christ. So many of us have experienced that radical love here and know this to be a community of faith that models the kind of active love of which Paul writes. Do we do this perfectly? No. Do we fall short of the ideal that Paul applauds in his letter? Yes. 
but out of love we commit to the messy and difficult work of being the church in a fractured world. Out of love we commit to living out faith through service within and beyond these walls. And through the grace of Jesus Christ, we do nudge this world ever closer to the kingdom of God. Friends, this kingdom can only be built with love. The kind of love that gives generously and selflessly. So I ask you, how will you bear this love to the world?